Okay, tuloy tayo. Um, isang ano lang, joke. Uh, in the comic section ng, I think, Inquirer, meron diyang prof, di ba? The first, uh, at the topmost prof. May professor dyan. Um, sabi ng isang mama, sa sobrang hirap ng buhay, wala na ang aking isang kidney. Okay? Sabi ng prof, oh, ano nangyari? Bakit? E binenta mo ba ang isa mong kidney? Sabi niya, hindi. Sa hirap ng buhay, kinain na ng bituka ko ang isa kong kidney. <laughs> Yan ang kanyang joke. Okay? Uh, mas maganda ibenta mo na lang, di ba? At least 150,000 yata ang price ng isang kidney sa tondo ngayon. So, consider this uh, scenario. A delivered a sum of money to B. And uh, a year thereafter, A demanded for the return of the sum of money, maybe 100,000 plus interest. B refused uh, to return the 100,000 claiming that uh, it was a donation when obviously A intended such to be a loan with interest. Okay? Nothing was put into writing. Is reformation a remedy under these circumstances? Clearly the answer is no. Because under the facts, there was really no meeting of the minds. In order for reformation to be a remedy, there was a meeting of the minds. Okay? Uh, a contract may have been perfected. Okay? But there is one other reason why reformation cannot be a remedy under the circumstances. Because nothing was put into writing as to this remedy, this is a remedy known as reformation of instruments. There must have been a written agreement. Okay? But why reformation is a remedy is because while there was a meeting of the minds, the intention of the parties was not reflected in the instrument. Okay? So the real intention was not reflected and therefore this remedy in equity is intended for the real intention to be reflected, okay? For that uh, contract to be construed as to conform with the real intention, okay? A common problem on reformation would involve uh, a sale, whether a sale with a right to repurchase or even an absolute sale, because these instruments may actually be regarded merely as an equitable mortgage. And therefore, under the law, reformation would be the remedy. Okay? Now, why would the instrument not reflect the real intention? There are many reasons. It could be by sheer uh, ignorance of the person who prepared the contract. It could be because of negligence lack of skill, bad faith on the part of uh, the person who prepared, or it could be bad faith on the part of one of the contracting parties. Okay? Maybe one of the contracting parties uh, asked uh, the other to sign an instrument which does not reflect the real intention. Ang dapat na intention ay mortgage, pinapirma siya ng sale with a right to repurchase. Okay? Now, but it could also be because of mistake, okay? But take note, the mistake here must be a mistake on the instrument. It should not be a mistake in obtaining consent. Because if the mistake, again, pertains to the obtaining of consent, the remedy is annulment because the contract would be voidable. However, if the mistake is on the instrument itself, Again, the instrument does not reflect the real intention. The remedy is reformation. Now, um, what if? In the deed of sale, uh, 
the object of the contract was um, ano itong uh, drugs na mga social mga mayayaman ha uh, aside from ecstasy medyo ano ano yan ano yung mga pangmayaman talaga ang mga heroin di ba mga ganyan yan talaga mga medyo social talaga yon mga mahal talaga heroin or others would say yung isa pang derive cocaine di ba mga talagang ano cocaine first class talaga kasi ang shabu para sa mga poor, okay? Sa mga may hirap na mga adik, okay? Uh, shabu ang kanilang tinitira, okay? Well, you can just even imagine yung effects. Yung effect ng shabu ay talagang butas-butas ang utak mo, di ba? At least pag uh, cocaine, medyo ano, social ang dating, okay? Now, uh, What was stated in the contract was cocaine. But actually, what the part... Ah, uh, let's start with what was stated in the contract was uh, morphine. Okay? But what was intended was cocaine. Would reformation be a remedy? Clearly, the answer is no. If the real contract is a void contract, reformation is not a remedy. But on its face, the contract is void kasi ang nakalagay, heroin, may it be the subject of reformation? Yes. If the real intense, intended contract is a valid contract, heroin ang nakalagay pero ang real object was morphine and morphine is not a prohibited substance. It is merely a regulated substance and therefore the sale may be a valid sale okay and reformation would be a remedy how would you know if the substance is a regulated substance sometimes the doctor kung may doctor kayo may ibang doctor who would not uh, bother to explain to you diba magreresita lang siya bigay lang ng resita bili mo yung medicina na ito so once i uh, went to uh, a mercury drug drug store and uh, uh, asked uh, one of the sales girls for this uh, medicines for the drugs okay however before giving to me the medicine sabi ng sales clerk sir uh, kasi ang pangalan nandoon na di ba sir anong address nyo <laughs> sir anong telepono nyo sabi ko bakit bibisitahin mo ba ako <laughs> sa bahay. It turned out, pag-regulated ang drugs, dapat kinukuha nila ang personal circumstances, okay? Ng buyer. That is required by law. Okay? So, malalaman mo, medyo regulated na palang substance. Now, there are also some contracts or acts which cannot be the subject of reformation. Ang pinaka madaling isipin ay wills, okay? Wills cannot be the subject of reformation. If uh, the will does not uh, reflect the real intention, obviously, if he's still alive, his remedy is execute another will, okay? Or maybe a codicil, just to explain his, uh, the will which he previously executed. Or, uh, if he's already dead, the remedy here under the law is uh, uh, for pieces of evidence to be presented in order to show the real intention of uh, the deceased, okay? Now, uh, of course, simple donations inter vivos where no condition is imposed is cannot also be the subject of uh, reformation, okay? <clears throat> Now, into interpretation of contracts, okay? <clears throat> Again, uh, In the interpretation of contracts, uh, this uh, would pertain to the determination of the meaning of the words or uh, terms uh, used uh, by the parties in the contract. Okay? How uh, should the words, the terms used be interpreted? Okay? Uh, pag lawyer na kayo, um, you would uh, definitely uh, be in a scenario where 
both uh, uh, sides would interpret uh, the same contract in totally different ways. Okay? Siyempre, ang interpretation mo would always be consistent with the interest of your client. You will be surprised how lawyers would interpret contracts or stipulations. Minsan, wala sa mundo ang kanilang interpretation. Okay? Basta yun ang kanilang interpretation. Okay? But, okay? in the interpretation of contracts, what if the terms of the contract are clear as to their meaning? Okay? Therefore, the literal meaning of the stipulation shall control? The answer is not necessarily. Okay? The terms of the contract may be clear, okay? but the terms of the contract may not reflect the real intention. What will prevail still will be the intention of the parties. Okay? The question here would be, how would you know the real intention if the terms of the contract are, are clear as to their meaning? Ito ang meaning ng kontrata. Eh. If you just read uh, the words, the terms used, ito ang kontrata, ito ang terms. But how would you know that those uh, terms do not reflect the real intention? The law also would provide for, uh, how, for the manner of determining whether uh, that goes into the intention of the parties, which is to consider the contemporaneous and subsequent acts of the parties. Okay? Uh, one good case here, uh, decided by the Supreme Court, uh, is the case of citizen surety. Okay? Uh, citizen surety versus Court of Appeals. Okay? Uh, there were a few contracts entered into, mayroong uh, sale, uh, to secure the fulfillment of the sale, mayroong bond issued by citizen surety. Okay? Tapos may indemnity agreement, mayroong ding uh, deed of assignment. The issue here pertains to the deed of assignment because the um, debtor, the principal debtor here in relation to the sale, the buyer, uh, claimed that uh, the deed of assignment was by way of the shon in pago which extinguished its obligation under the deed of, uh, under the indemnity agreements, okay? Uh, but really, uh, was the deed of uh, assignment uh, uh, a form of the shon in pago? When the Supreme Court considered the subsequent acts of the parties, ito ang mga subsequent acts. After the execution of the deed of assignment, this debtor, continued to pay. Therefore, was the deed of assignment a form of dasyon? Mukhang hindi. Because if there was really dasyon in pago, then the obligation must have been extinguished. And then when, why would he pay? But more than that, not only did the debtor continue to pay, he executed a real estate mortgage in favor of the creditor. So why would he execute a real estate mortgage if his obligation was already extinguished by way of the shon. Does the Supreme Court rule that the deed of assignment obviously does not partake the nature of the shon in pago? In fact, it was only a form of security arrangement. Okay? Now, uh, in the case of uh, Limi Luya versus Court of Appeals, okay, uh, the parties here entered into a contract of sale and it was stipulated in the contract that the price uh, uh, is deemed paid upon the signing of the contract. Okay? Despite that stipulation, an action was filed by the seller claiming that the price had not yet been paid. And nakalagay sa deed of sale, deemed paid upon signing, inapirmahan na ang deed of sale. Di ba tama that the price must have been paid? Or is it possible that there was such a stipulation but the price really had not yet been paid? Well, it is possible. Di ba? Magaling lang ang buyer. Pinilagay niya sa deed of sale na paid upon signing but after the signing of the contract, he may have told the seller, sandali lang ha, after getting the goods, kung mga jewelries lang, ito madali. Sandali lang, pupunta lang ako sa ATM. Okay? Okay? 
after one year, wala pa, hindi pa bumabalik, di ba? So, despite the fact that the deed had already been signed and it, there was a stipulation that the paid upon signing, the price may not have been paid. But in this case, was the price paid already? The Supreme Court again considered the subsequent acts of the parties, the contemporaneous and subsequent acts, in determining whether the price, in fact, had already been paid. Of course, it considered first the fact that after the signing of the deed of sale, yung mga um, delivery orders okay, have, have been delivered to the buyer. Okay? With this delivery order, in fact, the buyer was able to obtain the goods from the seller. So sabi, uh, with this, apparently the price had already been paid. Bakit magdi-deliver ang seller ng delivery orders? Why would the seller allow the buyer to obtain the goods if the price had not yet been paid? Pero personally, uh, tingin ko it is possible. Mabait lang ang seller. Okay? Despite the fact that there was a stipulation, he still allowed the buyer to obtain the goods even if the price had not yet been paid. But, I would consider another fact proven by the buyer as the most telling of all these facts, okay? That in fact, the price had already been paid. Magaling ang abogado ng buyer. He required, he, uh, required uh, certain documents of the corporation, seller dito corporation, to be presented, to be brought to the court, okay? And in these documents, uh, in, the, in the receivable document, documents as to receivables ng company, there was nothing uh, mentioned in the account receivables as to the price to be paid by the buyer. In other words, from the document of the seller himself, it appears that the price had already been paid. Otherwise, that amount should have been entered into as an account receivable. Di ba? So, because of that, the Supreme Court ruled, considering the subsequent acts of the parties, the uh, uh, court uh, uh, ruled that there was, in fact, already payment of the price. Um, there was another reason, of course, cited by the Supreme Court in relation to another rule, okay? That uh, if there is an ambiguity in a contract, okay, the... Interpretation of obscure words or stipulations in a contract shall not favor the party who caused the obscurity. Ikaw ang gumawa ng kontrata, if there is an ambiguity, it will be construed against your interest. In that case, Limiluya versus Court of Appeals, it was the seller who prepared the contract. And therefore, the Supreme Court also cited as a basis to its conclusion that since uh, the corporation was the one who prepared the contract, any ambiguity in the contract shall be construed against the interest of the party who caused the obscurity. In the same manner, in the case of Eastern Shipping versus Margarine Verkauf, okay? In relation to the interpretation of a provision in the Bill of Lading as to the extent of the liability of the common carrier, uh, as a result of damage caused to the goods of the shipper, okay? Since there was an ambiguity and the bill of lading obviously is prepared by the common carrier itself, the ambiguity was resolved against the interest of the common carrier, obviously in favor of the shipper, okay? Now, um, finally, okay? This uh, specific scenario... What if uh, a car or a parcel of land na lang, okay, uh, was the object of a contract of sale and uh, the subject matter, the object was described as this parcel of land located at the corner of Jose Rizal and Bonifacio Streets, for example, in one city. Now, it turned out that uh, as would normally happen in, in an intersection, there would be four corners, okay? What if the seller had at least two parcels of land, dalawang corners sa kanya, ilalo na kung apat, lahat sa kanya, and the buyer would claim, I bought this particular parcel of land, but the seller would say, no, I sold the other parcel of land at the other corner. 
And even if you uh, use the other rules on interpretation of contracts, the ambiguity could not be resolved. Okay? How would this uh, uh, obscurity or ambiguity be resolved? The problem pertains to a doubt cast upon the principal object of the contract. And in such a way that it cannot be known what may have been the intention of the parties, the law provides that the contract is void, should be considered as null and void. Okay? Now, on the other hand, in a sale of uh, a car, a specific car, no, uh, modified, okay? in an agreement where A obliges himself to deliver and transfer ownership over a car, okay? a determinate car, and when that car was delivered to B, B noticed that the stereo was no longer there. It was removed by A. Claiming that he is entitled also to the stereo, he demanded for the delivery of the stereo to him. A, of course, claimed that he is not obliged to deliver the stereo to B. Okay? Sa kanya dapat daw ang stereo. Who is correct? C A or C B? Okay. Now the answer somehow I discussed last night depends on the nature of the contract or transaction as to cause. Whether the contract is gratuitous or the transaction is an onerous transaction. Okay? Because if the transaction entered into between A and B is an onerous transaction like a sale. The rule that should be applied in case the other rules and interpretation of contracts are not applicable, the rule that should be applied is the greatest reciprocity of interest. It should be settled in favor of the greatest reciprocity of interest. Okay? This would be obviously true because in the problem, pag onerous, this could be a sale. Okay? And uh, the scenario would pertain to an ambiguity uh, which refers only to an incidental circumstance. Hindi naman yung principal object itself, but only an incidental circumstance kasi stereo lang naman. Again, the law would provide for the application of the greatest reciprocity of interest. But if the transaction was a gratuitous transaction like a donation, the law provides that the least transmission of rights and interest shall prevail. Okay? A scenario could be a donation. Okay? A donated the car to B. Should A be entitled to the stereo? Should B be entitled to the stereo as well? Mukhang hindi. Di ba? Kasi donation lang naman ito eh. Uh, B did not pay for the uh, car. In other words, if he would really demand for the delivery of the stereo also, ang tawag sa kanya ay swapang, di ba? Dinonate na nga sa kanya, binigay na nga ang kotse, pati ba naman stereo uh, pag didiskitahan pa niya, okay? So the law would provide that such would pertain to the donor under the principle of the least transmission of rights and interest, okay? So, we can proceed to uh, the last major topic, okay? Mo some, at least some authors, would uh, enumerate uh, contracts as defective contracts. Ito daw ang defective contracts. Resistible, voidable, unenforceable, and void, okay? Uh, did the civil code enumerate uh, defective contracts? Wala naman, okay? Ang civil code would only provide for chapters. My chapter on resistible, uh, voidable, unenforceable, and void. Okay? I also cannot agree on void contracts being defective contracts. Okay? Because void contracts are not merely defective contracts. They are actually inexistent contracts. Iba ang defective, iba ang wala. Okay? Ang defective na makina, nandyan ang makina. Pero pag walang makina, ay bibili ka pa ng makina. Di ba? Now, uh, thus, ang tamang uh, classification would be 
yung resistible, voidable, and unenforceable, they are defective. In fact, under the law, ang classification ng contracts na ito, they are valid. Okay? But they are defective because, precisely because, recession is a remedy as to resistible contracts. Annulment would be a remedy uh, sa voidable or annulable contracts and uh, uh, ang remedy doon sa unenforceable simply is you just uh, uh, object to the presentation of evidence to prove the existence of the contract. Okay? Now, uh, thus, ang mas magandang classification, mayroong valid contracts, pero under valid, may valid and binding, pero mayroong defective. Okay? On the other hand, may void contracts. Now, uh, valid but defective ang resistible why? In the first place, uh, before answering that question, is, uh, can there be a ratification of these contracts? Okay? Obviously, hindi ang valid and binding. There is nothing to ratify. It's valid and binding already. But uh, void contracts, can they be ratified? Under 1409, these contracts cannot be ratified. Although, is there a contract which is void, which can be ratified? I dare to say yes. Uh, 1898 uh, would tell you that a contract which is void can be ratified. But this is an exceptional scenario where an agent entered into a contract in excess of his authority or outside the scope of his authority and the third person with whom he entered into such contract knew that the agent is acting outside or in excess of his authority. That contract is not merely unenforceable, it is void. It is a void contract. However, the law also expressly provides that that contract can be ratified by the principal. Aside from that contract, again, void contracts cannot be ratified. As to defective contracts, can they be ratified or are they subject to ratification? There is no question as to voidable and unenforceable contracts. They can be ratified. Okay? However, as to resistible contracts, there is nothing to ratify. Okay? Resistible contracts cannot be the subject of ratification because... There is nothing wrong with the essential requisites of this contract, okay? In fact, if there is a defect in the contract, the defect goes into the fact that a party to the contract or a third person would suffer economic prejudice or lesion, okay, in relation to the contract. Yun ang defect. So there is no defect as to consent, as to the object, as to cause. There is nothing to be ratified, okay? Thus, um, um, kung ang defects are resistible goes into damage or economic prejudice, ano effectively ang defects sa voidable? Sa voidable, it, the defect basically would pertain to uh, incapacity which pertains to the capacity to act. The capacity to act is just the power to do act with legal effects. Okay? Uh, however, um, aside from incapacity, the other reason why a contract would be voidable is because of vitiation of consent. Basically, wala nang iba. Okay? Although, if you still remember, if you studied this uh, uh, contract entered into by a spouse over a property like a sale, over a property which is a conjugal property, if you remember, under the Civil Code of the Philippines, this contract is a voidable contract. At least the Supreme Court, uh, at some given point in time, nag aaway, -aaway sila. Is this voidable merely or void? Okay? Sa latter uh, decisions, before the effectivity of the Family Code, medyo settled na yon na voidable lang ito. Okay? And it has basis under the Civil Code. But under the Family Code, Obviously, this contract is not merely voidable, it is really void. Okay? I think this is a better classification of the contract because there is really lack of consent. 
of one of the parties, one of the spouses, and therefore it should not merely be voidable, it should be void, although the family code would consider this contract as a continuing offer to the other party who did not give his consent until that uh, uh, contract is withdrawn by either of the parties, okay? Now, unenforceable, uh, a few reasons, okay? Basically, I mentioned one because uh, it is not in the form prescribed by law under the statute of frauds or maybe because uh, uh, both parties are incapacitated, okay? Kaya yun yung defecto or pa pangatlo because uh, while the person was authorized to uh, represent uh, the other, he acted in excess or outside the scope or wala talaga siyang authority. So, unenforceable. Those are basically the defects, okay? Now, uh, of course, void contracts basically because of lack of one of the essential requisites or because it is contrary to law, morals, etc. okay? So, let's start with uh, resistible contracts, okay? I may have told you this is not a favorite sa bar exam. Ang paborito sa bar exam ay unenforceable at saka void contracts, okay? Uh, but there's always a first time, okay? Resistible contracts. When would a contract be resistible? Take note, the contract here itself is resistible. Because recession is a remedy, does it mean that the contract is resistible? Not necessarily. You must have studied in 1191 that recession may be a remedy not because the contract is resistible but because there was substantial breach. Okay? The reason why recession is a remedy under 1191 is not because there was economic prejudice suffered by one of the contracting parties by the fact that the contract was entered into but because there was substantial breach uh, of one of the parties, okay, or fundamental breach. Uh, here lies the difference between uh, recession under 1191 and recession under uh, resistible contracts, 1380, 1381. Um, in one case, decided by uh, the Supreme Court in 2008, uh, a, a motion to dismiss was filed on the ground, an action for recession first was filed. Now, a motion to dismiss was filed because allegedly the action had already prescribed because the action was filed more than four years from the date of the contract. Was this, was this motion granted? Okay? Tama ba ang motion? Because the contract was, because the action was filed more than four years from the date of the contract. The Supreme Court said that that the, the, the reason why this motion was not appropriate, okay? uh, the movement obviously was in error because the ground for recession here was not because of uh, an economic prejudice, okay? where the action for recession should be filed as a rule within four years from the date of the contract. Thus, in recession under 1191, if the contract is in writing, the action would prescribe only after 10 years. Okay? So, magkaiba ang recession sa 1191 and 1380-1381. Uh, okay? Now, um, of course, uh, the other difference, major difference is under 1381, this is a subsidiary remedy. Okay? There should be no other available legal remedy to the aggrieved party. Whereas in 1191, the recession there is a principal remedy. He can invoke that remedy without invoking any other remedy. Okay? Uh, of course, uh, 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 the, you uh, should know that uh, yung recession under 1191 was just the result of an erroneous translation of the Spanish term. Okay? Ang tamang term sa English should have been resolution. Okay? Nagkamali, kaya pinapaharapan tayo. There are two kinds of recession under the civil code when in fact 1191 should pertain to resolution. And therefore, in cases decided by the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court itself would use the term resolution in relation to recession under 1191. Ang totoong recession nasa 1381. Okay? Now, um, 
rescission. So when would a contract be a rescissible contract? A contract would be rescissible only because the law so provides. There has to be a law which declares the contract to be a rescissible contract. Okay? And uh, the most number of uh, rescissible contracts uh, enumerated is in Article 1381. Okay? Nandiyan ang pinakamaraming rescissible contracts. There are a few other contracts or agreements which are also rescissible. Okay? as provided under uh, the civil code. But into, uh, into uh, 1381, uh, when the guardian okay, enters into a contract involving a property of his ward and the ward suffered lesion of more than 25% or one-fourth of the value of the thing. Uh, first, you should always bear in mind that in that contract, if this is a sale, madaling isipin sale, the buyer must not be the guardian himself for the contract to be rescissible. Because if the buyer is the guardian, 1381 is not applicable. What is applicable is, as we have discussed, 1491, where the guardian is prohibited from acquiring by purchase. Okay? Hindi lang rescissible ang kontrata sa 1491, kundi void. But if the buyer is a third person, 1381 may apply, can be invoked. But another requirement is that clearly the property must be the property of the ward. Kung property ito ng guardian, eh wala tayong pakialam kung ibenta niya ng palugi. Di ba? The property must be the property of the ward. He is just representing the ward in that contract. Okay? Now, of course, the law further provides that uh, recession may not be a remedy if even if the contract is recessible because the ward suffered lesion of more than 25% when the court approved such contract. Okay? Now, um, does it matter if uh, both parties to that contract faithfully complied with the respective obligations? It doesn't matter. The contract would still be recessible. Okay? Even if the guardian delivered, the buyer paid, uh, the contract still is a recessible contract because the ward suffered lesion of more than one-fourth of the value. Same rule as to representatives, okay? Uh, uh, in relation to the properties of the absentees, more than one-fourth ang lesion, okay? Now, um, but uh, a problem here in, uh, as to the... Uh, Two uh, paragraphs, first two paragraphs, were, would pertain to a scenario where what if the property of the ward was sold for a price where the ward suffered lesion of more than 25%. Let's assume sale of shares of stocks, the value of the shares of stocks, 100,000 100, for uh, 100,000 shares, meaning one peso per share. And uh, the guardian sold the shares only for 60,000. So there is lesion of more than 25. In fact, 40% of the value. Okay? If thereafter the ward who attained the age of majority filed an action for recession, okay? uh, would recession only pertain to the uh, portion of the shares of stocks uh, where the ward suffered lesion. Halimbawa, di ba the buyer paid 60,000? So lesion was only up to the 40,000 shares. Uh, should recession only pertain to the 40,000 shares? Or should recession pertain to all the 100,000 shares uh, sold to this buyer? There appears to be a uh, uh, an inconsistency between uh, Articles 1384 and 1385, okay? Because in 1384, the law provides that recession shall only be to the extent necessary to cover the damages caused. So apparently, if you will apply 14, 1384, 
only to the extent of the damage cost, edi only to the extent of 40,000 shares. Isoli lang ang 40,000 shares, okay na. Di ba? But if you will read 1385, the law provides there would be, it would create an obligation to return whatever was delivered. In effect, this is the usual effect of rescission, which is mutual restitution, sulian. Therefore, the buyer should return all the shares of stocks as much as the ward, the former ward, would have to return the 60,000 which he received, di ba? which is applicable in this scenario. I would agree with Professor Tolentino on this issue that under the first and second paragraph, ang applicable provision is 1385, okay? Uh, where there would be an obligation to return. Mutual restitution would be the effect. Ang 1384 can only be invoked if the contract is receivable because it is in fraud of a, a creditor or creditors. Okay? Uh, in a sense, this is understandable because, for example, uh, this debtor, is indebted in the total amount of 300,000 okay to this creditor thereafter he sold uh asabi ko 100,000 na lang okay uh debt niya 100,000 he sold three parcels of land identical ang value ng bawat isa um 100,000 okay now uh, if recession would be granted in favor of the creditor because the sale was in fraud of the creditor. Should recession pertain to all parcels of land or would it suffice that recession should only pertain to one parcel of land? I think uh, 1384 would be applicable only uh, to the extent necessary to cover damage. Ang kanyang un unpaid debt is only 100,000. And the value of one of the parcels of land is all already 100,000. That would cover already the damage that may be caused to the creditor. And therefore, there should be no recession as to the sale involving the two other parcels of land. Okay? But that is as far as contracts in fraud of creditors. Otherwise, as to the other scenarios, mutual restitution should be a remedy. In other words, uh, again, in this effect of recession, uh, the party invoking this remedy must be in a position to return what he received pursuant to the contract. Okay? Otherwise, recession may not be a remedy. Okay? Uh, before discussing contracts in fraud of creditors, okay, the last uh, uh, scenario where uh, a contract would be receivable would be a contract involving a thing which is under litigation and example the thing was sold by the defendant uh, without the knowledge of the plaintiff and obviously without the knowledge and approval of the court okay that uh, sale uh, between the defendant and the third person under the law is a receivable contract Ang common misconception dito for this paragraph is because the property was sold, the property under litigation, this would only be in fraud of a creditor and therefore there has to be a proof of fraud in order for the contract to be receivable wrong. Okay? Iba ang contracts in fraud of creditors, iba ang things under litigation. Things under litigation, the fact that the thing is under litigation and it was sold by the defendant to a third person, the law provides that the contract is receivable. The premise of this article, however, of this provision is that the plaintiff won. Nanalo ang plaintiff sa kaso. Kasi kung natalo siya, pakialam niya kung uh, ibinenta ng defendant ang property na yon, Di ba? Even if that was sold without the consent of the plaintiff, if the defendant won in that case, recession obviously would not be a remedy. Okay? So, uh, ang pinaka-common na case, kasi wala pang ang tanong sa bar exam, would pertain to contracts in fraud of creditors. Okay? Uh, the question here first is, how is, how is fraud proven? How do you prove fraud? Okay? Because you have to prove that the contract was in fraud of a creditor, so there has to be uh, evidence that the contract 
was in fraud of a creditor. Okay? Uh, the law would actually provide for two ways of proving fraud. Okay? You can simply invoke a presumption or you may uh, present evidence uh, as to known as to uh, which are known as badges of fraud. Okay? Ang pinakamaganda ay combination. Meron ka ng presumption of fraud, may badge of fraud ka pa or badges of fraud. And this was really the scenario in the case of Sadora versus Kabaliw. Okay? Uh, in Sadora versus Kabaliw, the wife okay, filed an action against the husband for support. Okay? And uh, the court uh, decided the case in favor of the wife. And therefore, here, the wife is the creditor of the husband. After this judgment was promulgated, the husband sold his properties to his son-in-law. Okay? Now, uh, is the sale of these parcels of land in fraud of a creditor? The Supreme Court said yes. Okay? Why? Again, two ways. Una, may presumption of fraud na dito, mayroon pang badges of fraud. As so the presumption of fraud, when would a presumption arise that a contract or a transaction is in fraud of a creditor? Two scenarios. This may arise when a contract is onerous or this may arise when a contract is gratuitous. That the contract was in fraud of a creditor, even if the contract is an onerous contract, would arise if the contract was entered into after a judgment was rendered in favor of a creditor or there was an order of an attachment against the debtor, okay? When this transaction was entered into. Uh, take note under the facts, sa Kabali versus Adora, the sale was entered into after a judgment was rendered in favor of the wife. And therefore, under the law, this is presumed to be in fraud of a creditor. I would, however, uh, agree that this is only a disputable presumption. Okay, Just because the sale happened after the uh, decision in favor of a creditor, uh, while the presumption would arise na in fraud, this may be rebutted. Okay? Now, uh, pwede ring, uh, after an order of attachment was issued by the court, ayun, nagkaroon ng onerous transaction. Okay? Again, the transaction would be in fraud. Is it required that the judgment or order should already be final and executory at the time the transaction entered into was entered into by the debtor? The law did not so require, okay? Otherwise, kung magre-require ka pa ng uh, judgment to be final, by that time, naubos na ang properties ng debtor, di ba? Because upon receipt of the decision or the order, ay, uh, he can sell all his properties or dispose of his properties uh, to other persons in order to, uh, uh, for the his creditor, not to be able to uh, uh, levy upon any of his properties, okay? But if the transaction is gratuitous, when would uh, a presumption arise? Example, uh, in case uh, this debtor uh, had properties, the value of which, mga 10 million, out of the uh, properties, he donated properties na ang value ay 7 million. Eh, may creditor siya. Ang natira na lang 3 million. Is the donation therefore presumed to be in fraud of his creditor? Well, not necessarily. Because the presumption will arise only if with the donation, he did not reserve sufficient properties to cover his debts. So, kung ang debts niya ay only 1.5 million ang properties niya na natira, 3 million pa, ay walang presumption. Pero if his debts na nat, uh, unpaid, 5 million, itinira lang niya 3 million, the presumption arises that this is in fraud of uh, a creditor. Okay? Now, uh, as to the badges of fraud, in the, in the case of Cabaliu versus Sadora, one badge of fraud is the close relationship between the parties to the contract. Okay? Kung ang seller tatay, ang buyer anak, 
there is obviously a close relationship. If you read the case of Hong Kong, Shanghai Bank versus Poly, ganun ang scenario. In Kabali versus Adora, the seller was the father-in-law, the buyer was the son-in-law. Okay? But if you have read the case, ang father-in-law, ang apelido niya ay Sadora. Ang son-in-law, ang apelido, Sadora din. Paano naging kaganon? Di ba dapat iba ang apelido niya? Kasi son-in-law siya. Ang dapat na Sadora ay ang babae. Pero pwede rin naman, di ba? May mga taong nag-aasawa, pareho ang apelido. I've had students na ang middle name De La Cruz, ang kanyang apelido na asa-asawa ay De La Cruz din. Okay? It doesn't mean na void ang marriage. Okay? Pwede nga wala silang blood relationship, pare-pareho ang apelido. Okay? Although sa amin, parang kokonti lang kami na Uribe. Okay? Parang wala masyadong Uribe sa Pilipinas. Nasa Columbia ang Uribe. Okay? Presidente ng Columbia. Okay? Now, uh, pero wala kaming relasyon doon sa <laughs> presidente na yun. Okay? Now, uh, but I have to warn you that close relationship between the parties alone per se cannot be a basis for the court to conclude that the contract was in fraud of a creditor, okay? Mag-isa siya, hindi pa sufficient, okay? Because may there be a valid and binding sale, a good faith sale between a parent and a child? Of course, okay? Uh, I would ordinarily uh, claim that normally, ang children mas mayaman kaysa parents, di ba? Kasi kung ang children mas lalong naghirap, either walang silbi ang parents or more often than not, pasaway ang anak, di ba? Otherwise, normally, the parents would really uh, strive na maging mas maganda ang buhay ng mga anak, di ba? That's, a common. That's why the children may have the capacity to buy the properties of the parents. Although, bakit mo pa bibilhin? Idibigyan mo na lang ng pera ang tatay mo o ang nanay mo. Pero pwede rin, di ba? Nabilhin mo. Now, but in this case, there were other budgets, okay? And another budge of fraud in a contract of sale would be the fact that the seller did not take possession of the property after the sale. Kasi kung tunay ito na sale, after the sale, dapat, who would be in possession? The seller. Ay, the buyer pala. I mean, the buyer did not take possession of the property after the sale, okay? Mukhang hindi totoong sale ito, okay? Mukhang simulated sale lang. But uh, the other budgets uh, would include yung uh, inadequate uh, uh, consideration of the conveyance. Uh, in one case, nakalagay uh, fictitious consideration of the conveyance. If the consideration is fictitious, would the contract merely be receivable? I don't think so. Okay? This should not be a budge of fraud which would make the contract receivable. Because if the consideration is fictitious, the contract should be void, not merely receivable. Because then there would be lack of one of the essential requisites. Pero inadequate or grossly inadequate, mukhang tama yon. Because for example, if a person is a debtor, ang debt niya ay 500,000 and he sold his property, ang value ng property niya 1 million, aba binenta lang at 50,000, mukhang that is in fraud of a creditor. Eh kung gusto mo talagang ibenta at bayaran ang uh, creditor mo, you should have sold it at its value, di ba? Para mabayaran mo ang utang mo. Okay? Thus, uh, inadequacy of the price uh, is a budge of fraud. But another budge of fraud uh, would pertain to a sale by a debtor and that debtor, uh, the sale is a sale on credit by a debtor who is already insolvent. Diba? Ang may gana pang magpautang uh, is samantalang insolvent na siya. Okay? Uh, kung insolvent ang tao, dapat he should sell his properties on cash basis so, so that he would be able to comply with his obligations. Again, a sale upon credit or on credit by an insolvent debtor is also a budge of fraud. Okay?
So uh, again, uh, uh, either uh, a few badges of fraud or a presumption of fraud or a combination could be the basis of the court in uh, uh, concluding that the contract indeed was in fraud of a creditor. Okay? Then uh, into uh, uh, the other requirements for rescission to be a remedy. Okay? Uh, I mentioned already that uh, under this uh, contract, receivable contracts, this is a subsidiary remedy. He must have no other legal means okay, to obtain reparation for uh, the damage uh, incurred. Okay? Now, uh, another requirement as a consequence, again, of recession, again, is he must be able to return okay, whatever he may have uh, uh, he may be obliged to restore, okay? Mutual restitution. But one other scenario, okay? Um, in a sale, uh, where the seller was the debtor, okay? Itong seller is the debtor, okay? Mayroon siyang creditor, siyempre, but he sold his properties to this uh, buyer, in fraud of a creditor, okay? Now, uh, the law provides that rescission would not be a remedy if the thing which is the subject of the contract is lawfully in the possession of, the, of a person who did not act in bad faith, okay? Uh, so what if the buyer acted in good faith? Hindi niya alam ang uh, intention ng debtor ng seller na to defraud pala his creditor would recession be a remedy okay or in that provision is it required that the person who may be in legal possession should be a third person in relation to the sale it is claimed by an author or two authors that this third person can only be uh, another party in relation to the buyer. For example, the buyer resold the thing to this third person. Ito daw lang ang pwedeng mag-claim ng legal possession if he is in good faith, which is wrong. Okay? I would agree to the, to the position that the third person referred to who may be in good faith is the buyer from this debtor. Okay? He is a third person in relation to this debt. Okay? As long as the buyer is a buyer in good faith and for value, he would be protected under the law. And the rescission of this sale would not be a remedy. Okay? Now, uh, then, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, as far as the action for the uh, rescission of the contract to prosper as a rule, it should be filed within four years from the date of the contract. However, if the ground for the recession is because the contract was in fraud of a creditor, the law provides that the four-year period will be reckoned from, uh, from the discovery of the fraud. Okay? However, a qualification to this rule, discovery of the fraud, it need not be the actual discovery. It could be from the time of the registration of the sale, okay? Because in the case of Hong Kong Shanghai Bank versus Poly, uh, the bank filed an action for recession. Actually, ang tawag nila sa action nila annulment when in fact it should have been recession. The action for recession was filed within four years from the time the bank actually discovered, but it just happened that the uh, sale was registered more than four years from the action from the filing of the action the Supreme Court ruled the, the action had already prescribed okay uh, so tingnan nyo kung may registration because it will be from the time of registration that the four-year period will be reckoned okay of course if the ground is uh, uh, pertains to contracts entered into by the guardian this would pertain to uh, the four year period will be reckoned from the time the ward uh, uh, attained the age of majority or recovered from the incapacity okay hindi from the date of the contract okay now uh, hong kong shanghai bank okay versus poly 
So we can uh, discuss probably last I voidable contracts, okay? <coughs> uh, voidable contracts again. The defect only pertains to incapacity and vitiation of consent, okay? Because one of the parties is a minor, one of the parties is insane, therefore the contract is voidable. And these rules, as far as voidable contracts, uh, are applicable even to other agreements like partition, okay? As uh, seen in this problem, okay? Uh, during my time, okay? It, X was the owner of a 10,000 square meter property. Um, X married Y, and out of their union, A, B, C were born. After the death of uh, Y, X married Z, and they begot a children, D, E, F. Okay? So, maraming anak si X. Okay? After the death of X, the children of the first and second marriages executed an extrajudicial partition of the first stated property on May 1, 1907. DEF were given 1,000 square meter portion of the property. They were minors at the time of the execution of the document. D was 17 years old, E was 14, F was 12. And they were made to believe by A, B, and C that unless they sign the document, they will not get any share. Z was not present then. In January 1974, D, E, and F filed an action in court to nullify the suit, okay? alleging they discovered the fraud only in 1973. Can the minority of D, E, and F be a basis to nullify the partition? Explain your answer. How about fraud? Explain your answer. Okay? Uh, basis to nullify, well, strictly speaking, it is not to nullify. It is to annul the contract. Okay? Uh, can the minority be a basis? Yes. Okay. Uh, when they entered into this agreement for partition, they were minors, 17, 14, and 12. And that was 1970. Uh, when the action was filed in 1974, uh, the action was filed within four years, definitely, from the time uh, D attained the age of majority. Okay. In fact, at that time, 1721, uh, at that time, the age of majority was still 21, okay? And therefore, baka hindi pa nga siya of age, okay? Depende sa kanyang edad, okay? Kung siya na, uh, the, the month of his birth, okay? Now, D, E, and E were definitely minors in 1974, okay? Uh, Thus, uh, minority would be a ground. How about fraud? Definitely, fraud is also a ground for the annulment of a contract. As obviously, yung minority pertains to incapacity, the fraud pertains to vitiation of consent. Kaya, why there was fraud? Because they were made to believe by A, B, and C that unless they sign, they will not get any share. Okay? That, I believe, also is a fraudulent uh, representation. Okay? Now, uh, uh, the, a provision under the law on succession expressly would uh, provide for the applicability of the provisions on contracts in relation to uh, these provisions, okay? This scenario. Now, uh, what else, okay? Um, the question next, we have uh, mentioned earlier that uh, voidable contracts are subject to annulment, okay? Uh, uh, ratification, subject to ratification. Uh, any of the parties or ratification uh, would require the consent of both parties to the contract? The answer is no, okay? Uh, because only the party who is incapacitated or only the party whose vitiation, whose consent was vitiated, would have the right to institute an action for annulment, and therefore he alone can ratify the contract. Okay? Uh, kung sino ang nambugbog, of course, hindi siya pwede mag-ratify ng contract. The one who was, uh, upon whom violence was employed, siya ang pwede mag-ratify ng contract. Okay? Now, uh, uh, but may a third person uh, have the right to institute an action for annulment? The answer is yes, as long as he is subsidiarily obliged to that contract. Okay? 
ang mga subsidiarily obliged ay yung mga guarantors, pledgers, mortgagers. They are subsidiarily obliged and therefore the law would give them the right of action to institute an action for annulment. Otherwise, as a rule, third persons who are not uh, subsidiarily obliged would not have the right to institute an action for annulment. However, the Supreme Court ruled in one case that a third person may have the right to institute an action for annulment if he can show prejudice if the contract will not be annulled. Okay? A good scenario uh, would pertain to this uh, uh, where a thing was sold to a buyer but there was vitiation of consent on the part of the seller. Thereafter, the seller this time, wala nang vitiation of consent, sold the same thing to a second buyer. Okay? The second buyer is not uh, a party to the first, not privy to the first, not even subsidiarily obliged to the first. But he will definitely be prejudiced if the first case, if the first sale is not annulled. Diba? Obviously, the first uh, sale is annullable because there was vitiation of consent. But the third person, I would agree, would have the right to institute an action for annulment. The third person here is the second buyer. Okay? Now, um, ratification, of course, may be expressed or implied. Okay? The fact that the uh, person, the party who has the right to institute the, uh, action for annulment, accepted benefits from the contract may already be considered as a form ratification. An example dito would be if the, uh, if the minor sold probably or must be leased uh, his uh, parcel of land when he was only like... Uh, 17 years old, okay? Thus, the contract would be voidable. But despite the, the, uh, uh, despite the fact that he already reached the age of majority, nako, mga dalawat kalahating taon, he continued to receive the rentals, okay? That would be considered as a form of ratification, implied ratification, because he accepted the benefits arising from such contract, okay? Uh, annulment also would... Uh, uh, also have similar effect as recession. It would have, uh, it would result in mutual restitution. Okay, in other words, if uh, the agreed party uh, is not in a position to return what he received, the annulment may not be a remedy. But basically, it would depend on the reason why he was not, he cannot return. Because if it, he cannot return, because the thing which he's supposed to return was lost due to his fault, ay wala na. Uh, he can no longer have the contract annulled. But if it was lost due to a fortuitous event, ilalo na kung due to the fault of the other party, annulment would still be a remedy. Of course, if the action had already prescribed, again, uh, the action may no longer prosper, okay? Aside from there was ratification. Uh, I think uh, we should have lunch muna bago tayo mag-discuss ng unenforceable contracts kasi ito ang, ang pinaka-paborito, okay? Unenforceable contracts. Okay? See you at uh, 2 p.m. pa, no? Pwede pang matulog, okay? Mm -hmm. <sighs>